Hi, my name is Sue Skaskew with Vermont Volunteer Services for Animals Humane Society and welcome to our show for the animals. Today we have two guests, very exciting guests. One is Deb Turcott. She's the Executive Director of the Upper Valley Humane Society and she's brought Donkel. Donkel, who is? He is a male two-year-old lop-eared rabbit. What a cutie. And he's been so good for the past five minutes sitting on her lap. And he's a fabulous guest. Good. Um, and throughout the show, we're going to show other photographs of animals that are up for adoption. Wonderful. So, where are you located? The Upper Valley Humane Society is located at 300 Old Route 10 in Enfield. But for those of you who travel 89, you would best know it as exit 15 off of 89. And I love this, the banners that you always have outside. Thank you. Thank welcoming you. people in. I think Absolutely. That's a great it's, idea. A, it's a great way to show people that we're there and tell them about the exciting things that are going on. Yeah. Um, so tell me. What is the mission of the Upper Valley Humane Society? The mission of the Upper Valley Humane Society is to compassionately connect people and pets. And we do that in a lot of different ways, but really we're looking at flexible adoptions, helping people keep their own pets that they currently have, and if they're looking for a pet, to find the right match for them. How long have you been the executive director, Deb? I've been there a little over a year. Oh, okay. Didn't realize that much time had gone by. It goes by quickly. Yeah, they're a nice group of people there. I have a wonderful staff. You and really a, do. An amazing board of directors and the very forward thinking and really looking at how do we continually serve the community in the best way possible. People feel welcome when they go there. Or I've always felt welcome. That's wonderful to hear. We really try to help everyone find exactly what they're looking for and provide them with the resources that they need. Mm -hmm. And you know what I like too, the big area out front where the dogs go out and play? Yes, the play cages are very yes. popular with our puppies. Yeah. So. Um, so what do you do there? What's well, your job? I'm the executive director, so usually that means I'm sitting behind a desk, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm not one of the ones that gets to play and socialize with the animals like Donkle very much. So this is your relaxation This time. is my moment. <laughs> this is my big moment. Well, he seems very comfortable with you. He is. He's wonderful. And, and I do get the honor of occasionally having um, an animal that has difficulty socializing with people, sometimes they'll bring one into my office and because I'm in my office quite a bit, they get to sit in there and enjoy me and I get to enjoy them and we work on some of their people skills mm -hmm. so they could find a better home. But I spend a good amount of my time fundraising and talking to the community about what we do. I remember years ago, it was Joan McGovern mm -hmm. and when she used to be there, mm -hmm. she had Kara the pig. That yes. was a little. Yes, she had her own pig, and, and actually there were quite a few pigs that would come in to rescue there at that time. Yeah. Occasionally I get to bring my own dog to work uh, if I don't have another pet in the office. I saw a picture of your dog. You've got a Great Dane. I do. I have a Great Dane. He wow. is uh, he's a fabulous dog. I'm very, very fortunate. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Was he a Humane Society rescue? He wasn't. He was the product of irresponsible breeding. Uh, so I, I went through a system in Ohio to help eradicate that issue uh, mm -hmm. for that particular breeder, and so I brought him back with me. Um, Great Danes are sometimes hard to come by, and so, but I am connected with a couple of breed-specific rescues, because I've owned Great Danes for quite some time. Mm -hmm. so. We had a friend, um, Betty Berry, who had a Great Dane, mm -hmm. and we had the honor of babysitting him whenever they went away. <laughs> <and> <laughs> it's like having a horse in it's your like home. It's like having a horse head Counter. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And walking. <laughs> yes. Yes. He can drink right out of the faucet That's in the right. kitchen yeah. if he'd like to. So. Um, VVSA mm -hmm. is the administrator of the Vermont Spay Neuter Incentive Program, and that was fashioned after your New Hampshire law. Mm. And folks can have their animal spayed and neutered if they're income eligible mm -hmm. for just twenty-five dollars, mm -hmm. and then the balance is paid for by a designated state fund. Mm -hmm. um, and I often refer folks to you because I know that you have the spay-neuter clinic there with Dr. Sarah White. How often do you do it? We do our clinic at least once a month, mm -hmm. and we're very fortunate to have Dr. White come and join us for that. Uh, we move quite a few animals through in the process. She does an amazing job, mm -hmm. 40 cats and dogs in a day sometimes, and that's a lot of work. It is. So we do that once a month. Uh, we have a couple of months this year where we've actually expanded, and we're going to be doing two. 
Last year we did one dog only clinic because we do a limited number of dogs in each session because they are large and they right. take more time. So we've tried to find ways to better meet the needs of the community by offering specific clinics just for dogs. So people would call you at the Upper Valley? Yes, people could call us at the Upper Valley Humane Society at 603-448-6888 and they can leave a message or talk to someone at the front desk and just put a deposit down on their spot. We don't have necessarily an income eligibility uh, grid that we go by. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we do ask that if people could afford to do it through their own vet that they would save the spots for those who might sure. be less fortunate. Okay, we'll make sure we put that number up. But I love that it's mutt at the end. Yes. It's easy to remember. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what sort of animals do you have for adoption? Uh, a little of everything. Uh, we actually, as you can see, we have Donkle, and we have quite a few bunnies right now, and some that are very, very young and some that are older. We have cats, we have dogs, we have gerbils, we have mice. Uh, we recently just adopted out a set of rats mm -hmm. and a hamster. Sometimes we have ferrets, sometimes we have doves and other birds. Really? So it really depends on the day, mm -hmm. what might be in or out. and. Last year we did about 400 adoptions, so wow. you can tell that they are coming and going, which is wonderful. We're glad to see them have homes. Now, are the rabbits left over from last Easter's? No, not necessarily, although uh, it is fairly common for people to get think that Easter is an appropriate time to buy a gift for their child. Uh, right. And, you know, we're there to help people who aren't really sure what they got into. Uh, by giving them either behavior help or calling our behavior helpline and talking with us about, okay, my rabbit is doing this. How do I get it to stop? Or what do I do with this rabbit now that I have it? Our goal is that once you do get a pet, that we can help you keep it and have a very successful, happy relationship. But the, the rabbits, we see a little bit of an uptick about a few months after when people yeah. get the sense of what that kind of commitment might actually be. Donkle is being very quiet on my lap at the moment, but a lot of people will, will litter box train their rabbits and have them in their home or they give them a whole room. So it really depends on your lifestyle what the best pet is for you. They can be, we've had rabbits, mm -hmm. we rescued ooh, six from the Rutland Fair mm -hmm. years ago. Um, they were horribly treated. They had gone over the people, Amusements of America had gone over to New York and brought in what they considered meat rabbits, mm. and they were giving them as prizes, oh. which was horrible. Mm. One poor rabbit had maggots living internally. She oh didn't make it, but I had a fast learning curve about <laughs> <laughs> rabbits. I'm sure. They love to chew. They do. You have to make sure you keep giving them stuff. Yes. Um, we had beautiful cages built from mm -hmm. the outside out of wood. Mm. <laughs> Yes, they <laughs> do. Quite work. They do enjoy chewing the wood, and we've we let them out in the evenings into offices so they can romp around and have a good time. We do that with a lot of different animals, and we did have one set of rabbits that decided they would chew through all of the phone cords in one oh. particular <laughs> office. So we, we've learned that lesson ourselves. Yeah, they're interesting. They're funny. They're affectionate. They are. They're playful, but you just have to know what you're getting into. Absolutely, and we yeah. really try to help people understand what the behavior of that pet might be mm -hmm. when they come in and they say, I'm really looking for this, and we'll ask them some questions. Well, talk to us about your lifestyle. Let us know what do you like to do. If you want a dog, are you looking for one that you can hike with or just that's going to sit on your yeah. lap? All of those things help us point you to the pet that hopefully will be a great fit for your family. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Sure. One of the most common complaints I can hear about any shelter mm. is that people have a hard time adopting. Absolutely. But what people have to remember is every single animal that's in the shelter is because somebody made a commitment to that animal and then they didn't keep it. You know, the promise to keep the animal forever didn't work out. So the poor animal goes in, it's stressed, where's home, where's mm -hmm. mom, where's dad, where's my family? And you want to make sure that the next fit is just right. How do you do that? Well, we've really worked hard on our adoption process to help it be as flexible as it possibly can. You know, we're not here to tell you that you don't deserve a pet or that you can't have one, but instead to ask you those questions to better understand your lifestyle mm -hmm. and then to tell you as much as we possibly can about a particular pet you might be interested in. That way, we can ensure, or at least hopefully ensure, the best relationship when you get home. So we spend quite a bit of time in the adoption process, but we don't make it rigid, we're very flexible about it. We work very hard to understand both you and your desires when you come in. We have a brief form that we ask people to fill out. Mm -hmm. That way, 
we get some basic information about you because sometimes we might not have the pet that you're looking for at that moment. And then we take you through and show you some of the ones that we might suggest for you or a lot of times because of the internet and its prevalence for how people pick their pets, people will have come in and already have seen a pet online and they're very interested in that particular pet. And so we'll spend quite a bit of time giving them the opportunity to interact with the pet so they can best understand. And we're very, very honest and forthright about all of the idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. of some of the pets that we might get because we want you to know everything you can before you would take the pet home. Sure. And if things don't work out, we're always there for you. We're always there for the pet. You know, we want to be sure that people know that they could bring the pet back, but we work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. After the movie A Thousand and One Dalmatians years mm. ago, 101 or? 101, yes. 101 Dalmatians. Mm -hmm. We had somebody that went out and wanted a Dalmatian. Yes. They got the Dalmatian. Six months later, it wasn't right for their family. Mm. It's a very high energy dog. They wanted to get rid of the dog, and that drives me crazy, mm. that line. Mm -hmm. we, we get rid of trash. We don't get rid of animals, so they, I try to make sure that people understand mm -hmm. that. But it was a bad dog. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not a bad dog. It's doing what the breed and the temperament Suggests what yeah. it's been bred for, right? Yeah. right? So it's, you know, people should not feel intimidated when they go in. You're trying to do what's best for the animal. Absolutely, and really what's best for the animal is oftentimes what's best for the humans in their life as well. And so we try to make that, just like our mission says, to compassionately connect people and pets. And we recognize that that means we have to not only be good with animal behavior, but be good with people behavior right. too, to make sure that we understand what you're really looking for. And you know, if you were to bring home a Dalmatian and it wasn't the best fit, we do have services like our Lucky Dog Training Academy or our Behavior Helpline, ways that we can help you do everything that you can to bring the pet, keep the pet in your own home mm -hmm. as opposed to bringing it to us. But if push came to shove, we would be there for that pet. Do you find any particular breeds are brought in after movies or whatever? Well, we did see a definite increase uh, after Paris Hilton would carry around her chihuahua uh, mm. in the small breed dogs. Uh, it is, you know, the, the pocket dogs or purse dogs that we see are very trendy, uh, although that has diminished probably in the last year or so, but for some time that was very, very popular. Uh, and we're finding that uh, because those dogs are so small, people think that they can either have a lot of them or they may not really understand. Chihuahuas have a very specific temperament <laughs> and they really like to run the show. They do. And so, you know, it's a big dog, a little dog with a big attitude, really. Yeah. And so a lot of people found that that wasn't exactly what they were looking for. So we have seen quite a bit of that. And there, in fact, there are rescues all over the country that are Chihuahua specific because of that. Well, you know, speaking of that, I have a good friend that takes her dog, Dami, mm, to your services. Yes. And um, Sheree and Snook bring Dami there once a week. Well, we did a foundation for, you know, one raised for foundations that year. Okay, so you have different foundations. Can you talk about your training? The Absolutely, services? sure. Uh, lucky Dog Training Academy, which is what we branded it because we want all dogs to be a lucky dog, uh, is a fabulous resource for the community. And we have really looked at it and focused it back down on some of the really positive principles for positive reinforcement training. And so we want to help you or Dami's owner or anyone else to understand that you, there are ways that you can get your dog to do what you want them to do because they want to do it, mm -hmm. not because you're forcing them to do it. And that's the core principle behind how we train at Upper Valley Humane Society. So we find ways to creatively encourage people to use treats or to use praise or to even use play as a reward for dogs. And that way the dog is constantly understanding that if I do this, I get this. Not if I do this, this bad thing happens to me. Right. So we really try to look at it that way so that we're positively reinforcing the good behavior, You know, finding ways to redirect a dog's attention if they're doing something that we might not want them to do, which mm -hmm. happens from time to time. Uh, it's no, not all that different than how we, a lot of us work with our children. That's right. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. Yes. <laughs> um, and I want to mention, I've always heard we don't have a shelter. We try to put people in touch. If people call me and say they've got these cats, mm. well, I've got this call sure. or dog or whatever. But I understand, and I don't know if the figure is still accurate, that approximately one-third of the animals in shelters 
our pedigree? Or purebred? We get quite a few. Um, in fact, and, and that's where we see oftentimes the greatest instances of either hoarding or um, cruelty situations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's amazing to me that um, you know, people will feel very strongly about something that they would want and it takes a long time for them to understand what that breed's behavior might be. But we do, right now we have several German Shepherds that are purebred. We mm -hmm. have several Beagles that are purebred. Uh, we had one situation where we got four purebred dogs from the same owner, and they've all since found wonderful homes, which was great, but they were all, and some of them were um, what we might consider some of the high-class breeds, like an Airedale Terrier or mm -hmm. a Corgi. And so we definitely see purebreds come through. Uh, we don't see a lot of things like Golden Retrievers come through, mm -hmm. uh, but we see quite a few Labs. And I think you know a lot of that sometimes has to do with the fact that because it becomes popular, there'll be an increase in the breeding. Mm -hmm. And then if breeders aren't particularly careful about the blonde lines that they put together, you might end up with dogs that don't have the best traits of the breed. And that can be very difficult for some owners who might not be savvy about what that particular pet likes to do. We did, um, BBSA did a study called the Metcalf Study. Mm -hmm. We tracked newspaper ads on animals for sale, mm -hmm. dogs especially. And we have hundreds of backyard mom and pop breeders out there trying to turn a fast buck. Mm -hmm. But you know that those animals have not been vetted. Mm -hmm. They have not been tested for uh, body structure or, mm -hmm. or health. And I find that very frustrating. Um, so it's, I'm glad that you offer a spay neuter Absolutely. program. Do you make people, if they're relinquishing animals, have their parents neutered? before you take a litter? We don't see many breeders come in and give us their litter without the parents. Uh, typically, we will really encourage for all of them to be surrendered. Mm -hmm. uh, we do offer our spay-neuter clinic as a way that people could uh, prevent the problem from happening again. Right. And we work very hard with people to, really a, bi a huge portion of what we do is just educating people. Because there are a lot of people out there who may very well mean well, mm -hmm. but just don't know. I, exactly. I don't think people realize that still in the country, we're euthanizing animals because we Absolutely. have a surplus number. I just read um, in preparation for this, the count from when I was younger was 20 million. Now they figure it's about 3 million nationally, which mm -hmm. is still a big dip. But even if we're killing one, it's still too many. Absolutely. We find that there are a lot of folks out there who uh, like dogs, and so they'll get into breeding. And breeding is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, and to do it responsibly is just puts an extra burden on people financially, emotionally, and time-wise. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're so thankful for people who do come into our shelter who are saying, you know, we're just here because we don't necessarily either want to go to a breeder. And there are some great breeders out there, some people who are very, very responsible. But they're looking to us to say, what do you have that we can help? And mm -hmm. I think it's a great way for people to feel good and to teach their children quite a bit about the responsibility of pet ownership and why we might choose a humane society. Um, first of all, we're very affordable, comparatively speaking. And we do spay and neuter everything that leaves our door. Mm -hmm. It's a philosophy that we have at the Upper Valley Humane Society. And the only time that might not happen if it's an animal is so old or maybe in such bad health that to uh, sedate them would be dip would be dangerous mm -hmm. for them health-wise. And then it's a very special circumstance where we place the animal in a home. So. Let's talk about the difference between an open door shelter sure. and a closed door. And I don't think people understand that concept. It is very difficult. You know, we, we talk in the industry about things like open admission, limited admission, open door, you know, closed door or limited door, uh, no kill versus kill shelters. And I think it all gets very confusing for the consumer or the customer or the people who are interested in pets. And so really the best way for me to explain what we do at Upper Valley Humane Society, we are open admission. And that basically means we don't say no. Right. And so uh, we provide a variety of services to the community, but one of them is that we will take any pet. If we're very full, we may ask someone, is there any way you could wait a couple of weeks before the pet comes to us? If people are in a really hard situation where that's not possible, we find a way to make it work. So a lot of shelters, uh, because of their own philosophy, <laughs> hello, he wants to speak into the microphone himself. <laughs> um, because is there glue on that? <laughs> I don't like think so. Piece. What is that? It smells good. 
um, a lot of shelters, because of their particular philosophy, will actually uh, say no to particular animals. They will only take in pets that are clearly adoptable. I know, you're very excited. And so we actually don't do that. Uh, we have actually quite a few dogs right now that are on long-term behavior modification programs oh, that have come in. You, so we have no ticking clock. Uh, we work very hard to make sure that we've exhausted every resource that we can to help every pet find a good home. On occasion at the Upper Valley Humane Society, we may get that pet that is so dangerous to society or is suffering needlessly because it's just been you know, we unfortunately had a pet that was hit by a snowplow last week. And so there are pets that, you know, we take and we, uh, we understand that our responsibility to that pet is to make sure it does not suffer. Or that our responsibility to the community may be that we don't put you at risk or someone's child at risk. But we take that very, very seriously and we work very hard with all of our pets to make sure that we've given them every chance mm -hmm. to shine. And sometimes that takes a long time. We had a black cat named Inkspot who was with us for almost a year to the day before she got adopted out. And black cats, like black right. bunnies, like black dogs, can be very difficult to adopt out, but we're committed to those pets and helping them find a great home. That's good. Thank you. You said you, last year you adopted 400 out? Yes. That's wonderful. That's a lot of work. It is, it's, and it's, it's great to just see them and to get a lot of the happy tales back where people actually will email us and tell us a lot about what's going on with their pet. Thank you for letting me hold Donquil. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, and thank you so much, Deb, for coming and sharing everything about Upper Valley Humane Society. I think you, I just wanted meeting the mic. <laughs> 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 um, you do wonderful things. Thank you. And it's very nice to know that you're there, you serve the community, and people hopefully will support you on May 20th. We would love to have them come out, and we're happy to serve the community yeah. in the way that we do. Oh, and the other thing I didn't mention too, Upper Valley Humane Society supplies animal food through VVSA, so yes. I want to give you all that credit. Thank you. Because you make it possible for a lot of people that can't afford to feed their animals to eat. And Absolutely. so I thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. And thank you very much for watching For the Animals, and join us again next week. Okay, I almost forgot all that. stone across the sky and beyond to that place where all is known when I could fly when I could fly down the